I, I think my, the only thing I can say is imagine how cool it would be to be a middle doing research tied to NASA. And some of the things that we're looking for include skylights into lava tunnels, uh, terraced craters that allow us to understand the density of materials on the moon. How cool would it be to get to do that as your school project? That really should inspire kids to want to do science. And when you fund CosmoQuest, you fund us helping school kids be part of NASA's exploration of our solar system. So, hi. There is a real girl and the dark overlord himself. Hi there. Elle. Elle. <laughs> hi. Hey. How you doing? So, you, gave, you guys uh, told Tim uh, something about matching. Yeah, we've got two things. Can you guys hear me? It seems to yeah. say you can't hear me, and now you can. Okay. We've got two things that we want to make sure we, we mention at least a couple times this hour. One is we'd like to talk about the Kickstarter sort of happening sometime later this summer because it's relevant to our interest with this specific topic, as well as, of course, being relevant to us. Um, and then we're going to match any donations that come in this hour up to $1,000. Wow. Oh, my God. That is... <laughs> Thank we've you. been talking about it, sure, we've been talking about it all day, but if you, I mean, obviously we don't have the, the same focus as the CosmoQuest Twitter stream does, so we've been tweeting it, but if you guys want to tweet that, it doesn't have yeah. to be junkies, it's just... No, it I, we hadn't seen that yet. Is there a specific link to this that I can tweet out? What do I tweet with the link? Just to CosmoQuest.org? CosmoQuest it's on our homepage. Okay. It is CosmoQuest.org slash donate. And I think that every time... It's Pamela and uh, Nicole on the screen. You guys have, yeah, as the Chiron. You guys have it as the Chiron. Are we live? Yes. Yeah, we're live. Uh, Hello, yeah, world. Can, <laughs> I can YouTube link, too, if you want to share that out. That's the official YouTube link for this, uh, for this current segment. Okay. Where is, where is that at? Uh, you know what? I can also put it in the chat, which you guys Put it in the have. chat. I'll tweet the crap out of it. Thank you, Scott. Oh, I see you. You said hiya. All right, there's the YouTube <laughs> link for you guys <laughs> in the chat, so you can uh, share that out as well. Yeah, got it. All right, cool. Uh, Ryan Consul wants to know, he has no money to donate. Do we take armor or dragons? Uh, yes, 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 yes. 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 I, and I'm actually totally serious. Ryan, if Ryan wants to make me some kind of armor, like bracelets or something, I'll donate what he thinks is a, is a reasonable amount. I myself That's will fantastic. do that. That's fantastic. Yes, Ryan actually makes amazing armor. <laughs> I know, he really does. I'm totally down for that. I'm just going to sit here speechless talking. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. I know. <laughs> All right, what did you want to start the segment off with? <laughs> so so uh, the, the reason that we brought this a great combination of people, and, and we have to introduce the third person who's just yes. joined us, Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute. Uh, he is a senior astronomer there, and he's also host of, uh, what's, what's your radio show, Seth? Big, big, big Picture Science. And... Um, it, so he is the science side of combating uh, ignorance in the middle of the night sometimes, and Scott and A are working to combat it in fiction. And we all have to deal with this crazy Star Trek notion that you can just gallivant from planet to planet. That's um, me. <laughs> so oh, your communicator just went off. Captain Kirk yeah. wants to know what the hell is going on. <laughs> so, so during this segment, we're going to discuss, um, as we learn more and more about our galaxy's population of planets, are we heading towards an understanding that we do live in that Star Trek universe, or is this just a really awesome fantasy that doesn't truly exist? And uh, so we're going to let the science fiction writer ask the, the questions to the scientist, and I'm going to try and catch up on Twitter. <laughs> Well, well, Scott, you've got a universe where you have uh, teams on different planets playing football against each other. How do you make that work? Well, we do that with a healthy dose of don't look what's going on over here, just pay attention to the story. Of course, is uh, the, the area that most science fiction writers find themselves, unless you're writing really hard SF, anytime you want to have alien cultures interact in a Star Trek or Star Wars-like uh, way, 
where different races can actually be in the same room, breathing the same air, communicating with each other in one way or another, you kind of have to wave the hand at uh, different atmospheres and different gravity, etc., so that you can get the characters onto the stage. So this style of science fiction, it's, it's, it's more storytelling than big idea, although there are both, and it's more storytelling than, than hard science. So I'm excited to have Seth on here today so we can talk about just how realistic is it that if we discover enough planets, will there ever be some kind of situation, yeah, where we can just get on our spaceship on planet Earth, fly to another planet, get off, breathe the same air, and not be melted by toxic things in the, in the environment, etc. Right. Well, uh, I'll tell you, Scott, uh, I think that the, the chances are getting better all the time, simply because we're finding so many planets, you know about that. Uh, mm -hmm. We found close to a thousand, but but it isn't the number that's really interesting. What's interesting is the result that the majority of stars have planets. Now, if you want a planet where <laughs> I don't know about things that would be toxic, there you know there there are undoubtedly planets where uh, you would find it toxic to uh, try and breathe. But what you want is a planet where you can sort of walk around and uh, breathe a little of oxygen and stuff like that. Well, there might not be too many of those unless they already have life because. You know, the oxygen in our atmosphere is mostly due to uh, photosynthesis. That's mm -hmm. a, something of the last two billion years. And most planets are going to be more like, you know, Venus or Mars or whatever. They're, they're not going to have that unless they already have life, in which case maybe you'll encounter some cosmic company. So it's really, it's almost as if, if, we, if we discover enough planets, we're going to find planets that are fairly good to go out of the box, so to speak. We're going to find something that caters to us, oxygen breathing, carbon-based life form, relatively similar gravity, etc. So is, is the concept of the Star Trek universe where you can just gallivant all about, is that realistic? Well, it depends on your ability to gallivant. I mean, the, the, major, <laughs> the major problem is, you know, the distances between the, between the stars. I mean, let, let's just say that 70% of all stars have planets. In order to make that simpler, let's just say 70% is the same as 100%. Okay. I mean, there, there's, there's a miracle cow. Yeah, there's hardly any difference in astronomy between 70% and 100%. <laughs> and, in, and in fact, the nearest other star system to us, you know, Alpha Centauri, everybody knows about Alpha Centauri, supposedly has a planet, although it's a, it's a little questionable, but it doesn't matter. Probably there are planets there. Are any of them likely to be like the Earth, which is to say, when I say like the Earth, doesn't mean that there's oxygen there. It means it's a rocky planet, not a big ball of gas, and it's about the same size as the Earth, and it might have liquid oceans. Well, maybe one in one in a hundred of them, or one in ten of them, or something. Not all of them will be somewhat like the Earth, but whether they have oxygen in the atmosphere or not, nah, that's a lot harder because, uh, gosh darn it, as I say, you need life for that. As far as the gallivanting part, uh, you get in our fastest rockets today, and you can get to Alpha Centauri. 100,000 years from now, so you better take a box lunch. <laughs> that, that brings us to the other classic sci-fi trope, which is faster than light travel, which is just constantly, we just wave a hand at that one as well. Everybody's got their own pseudo-scientific or completely made-up magical system that gets you from one plant, plant, uh, place to another, whether that be warp drive or in the books that I write, something called a punch drive, which lets you go from one certain size gravity well to another certain size gravity well and go a lot faster than light. That's the other thing that stops us from having these, uh, these wonderful Star Wars, Star Trek type constructs. But that, and that, th is that something that we're, you know, in any number of lifetimes that we're going to get around or does that put us up against a hard, is there a hard wall of physics that just flat out stops us from going faster than the speed of light? Well, Scott, the answer to that is we don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I mean, Albert, Albert Einstein said that there's a hard wall, and it doesn't matter how much technological development you've got, you can't beat that. On the other hand, Einstein also pointed out, in a paper with this guy by the name of Rosen, he also pointed out that maybe wormholes were possible. Now, does physics really allow the kind of wormhole that you, not a worm, but you could actually drop in and then come out somewhere else, either in time or space, and therefore go and visit the Klingons without spending a couple of million years in a rocket ship in the middle sea? And the answer is, um, we don't know. I, actually, the jury's out on the physics 
we're not talking about the technology. That might be really hard. Undoubtedly, it's really hard. But we're just talking about the physics. So we don't even know if the physics allows it. But, hey, look, uh, if, if you say it doesn't, then that kind of reduces the scope of your stories a little bit. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a particular point that you do address in the book, Scott, um, that... Uh, there's the lifetime of a civilization, right? If there are several civilizations throughout the galaxy, the lifetime of a civilization over the lifetime of a galaxy or even a star uh, is tiny, right? Mm -hmm. And so we having over, having overlapping civilizations in time is a difficult concept, and that's something that you've addressed in the GFL as well. I got that from uh, Isaac Asimov, book called Extraterrestrial Civilizations, and it was I remember reading that, and it just blew my mind. Because there's always the concept of, well, all the other stars and planets are too far away. And if, they, if we are able to reach them, then we have to find a planet that will sustain our type of life enough that we can meet another culture and communicate with it, hopefully, or that they can reach us. Then there's a, a, a tertiary level to that, which is when you look at how long that the universe has been around and us evolving to intelligence at this particular very small point in time, the other culture has to be right about that same place in time unless they have radiated out or they have managed to not destroy themselves as we still have a strong possibility to, to, to do. And it really, it really adds an extra scope to just how difficult it's going to be to find extraterrestrial life and communicate with them. Well, there's some truth in that. Uh, that's the L factor in the Drake equation for anybody who's listening in who knows about the Drake equation. Maybe Frank Drake's listening in. He'll know about that equation. What uh, up, Frank? Or anybody <laughs> in the bank, they got that plaque up in that room, you know, where they came up with it. <laughs> but, uh, but, but there is this. I mean, a, a recent development is uh, the, the uh, realization that small star, uh, stars called red dwarfs, most stars are smaller than the sun. We like to think of the sun as being typical, but that's like, you know, most parents like to think that their kids are at least typical unless they live in Lake Wobegon, in which case they're better than that. Yeah. So, <laughs> or at least better than average. Yeah, yes. Exactly. So, so, you know, most stars, are, 9 out of 10 of them, are smaller than the sun. And those stars could also have habitable planets. In fact, it looks like something like one in six of them does has, has a planet where you could have liquid water. You know, that's a lot of planet pleasure because there are a lot of these little stars and they last forever. So the average one is, you know, 7 billion years old. So, you know, if societies, clever societies, sort of like ours, which, you know, I'll, I'll say is clever, uh, can arise and not self-destruct, if they can sort of avoid that, then there could be a lot of overlapping cultures uh, around these red dwarf stars because they're so old. And I have a question um, and you mentioned habitable planets, Seth, uh, I wonder, I always assume that when we're talking about habitable planets, um, not in sci-fi, we are talking about habitable by us or somebody similar to us. Are there, and I know this is a little crazy exobiology, but are there habitable planets for a silicon-based life form or an, uh, an other-based life form or something like that um, within or without our our close solar or our close cosmic neighborhood? Yeah, that's really a good question, eh? because indeed, when we say habitable world, what do we mean? What do we mean? Actually, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily uh, habitable by us, but it's got liquid water, it's got an atmosphere, that kind of thing. So, you know, terrestrial style biology could live in it. I mean, you know, for some microbes, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the fuel tank in a jet aircraft is habitable. Right, it wouldn't be for you. You wouldn't like living in there, but you know some bacteria apparently can exactly, do it. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you know, there is the question: what you mean by habitable? But normally, what we mean is that hey, could you have liquid water on the surface? That kind of thing, or maybe not on the surface, maybe slightly underground. But it's very, very unclear concept. I mean, everybody or many people will know about the moon of Saturn called Titan, and it's got lakes on the surfaces. The only other place in the solar system where we know there's liquid on the surface. But those lakes are, you know, liquid natural gas. They're the same things you use to cook your hamburgers tonight. So, you know, you couldn't live in them, but, you know, maybe a certain kind of biology, not necessarily silicon-based, carbon-based, could oh, live in there. Okay. There may be worlds where carbon-based doesn't work and some other kind of chemistry might. In science fiction, they like to talk a lot about silicon-based life. 
And, you know, Isaac Asimov, who's already been mentioned here, he actually did, he was a chemist, as you know, and he actually did some studies of that and, and decided, yes, under certain conditions, you could have complex molecules that were silicon-based that would mimic the kinds of things that carbon uh, makes. But in general, i got to tell you, uh, carbon is much better at this than silicon in almost all circumstances, maybe not ever. But it, it would be, you know, hubris of the first water to say we're the only kind of life that could possibly exist. Well, and at least for the, for the topic of this talk, this is why I asked, I think for the sci-fi aspect of that, it's not just a silicon-based, different. it doesn't have to be different enough from us to, it doesn't have to be silicon to be different enough from us, as you say, it can be carbon, but specifically quite a lot different to live in a different, like to live on Jupiter or something like that, to do something like that if there's the, pot, for a sci-fi story, if there's a possibility for that, I, I actually love that idea and I love those stories and in fact Scott you have several different species that can't play football because they're they, they live in a liquid environment and that sort of thing but they're football fans in your stories and yeah, so I and like how those two possibilities come together at least in, and I a quick quick point of order here to all the people watching at home in case you missed it A and I run a company called Dark Overlord Media and we are matching your donations as long as you can see these faces and Seth. What's that? And Seth. He got away. So uh, if you have not yet donated to Cosmo Quest, you can literally get into my wallet. If uh, you have donated, why not donate again? Because we're matching all the donations up to a thousand bucks for now. So going back to Ace Point, uh, in the the Sigilverse is a much more Gene Roddenberry type. This phase of the Sigilverse, excuse me, the far future, eight hundred years in the future, we discovered other races. We relative, we've already gone to war and races have eaten each other because we're also dietary compatible, which is great. And now everything's calmed down and it's relatively peaceful. There are species that evolved as water-based species or as amphibians, and really it's their body types that are completely unsuited to the game. So there's a lot of rate. It's not like everybody can just show up and play this high-contact, violent game of American football. They are, you know, we have spectators. There's a particular race that's actually the referees because they can fly and they can work their way in and around the field. But we don't know how many planets we have yet. Somewhere in the ballpark of, of 50, I think, I've figured out in the story, in the storyline of the Siglerverse. So the question, next question for Seth would be, if we have discovered a 1,000 exoplanets, I think that was the number thrown out, how many of those are Earth-like that we might have a decent shot of us being able to take our space jalopy there, hop out, and go for a walk. Well, you can, you can go for a walk as long as you don't mind a really short walk. I mean, <laughs> as I say, prob probably, probably none of them have oxygen. I mean, okay, but of the roughly, it's 850, 900 confirmed, confirmed mm -hmm. uh, planets found around other stars. I think nine of them are said to be in the habitable zone. We've already described how ambiguous that is but all right so that's one percent one percent but look at it this way in the uh, in the galaxy there are roughly a trillion planets that's with a T mm -hmm. and if one percent of them is uh, habitable that's 10 billion habitable worlds just in our galaxy and you know most of them are not going to be the kind that are plug-and-play you just step out of your rocket ship and enjoy the sunshine and the air but if a, even a small fraction of 10 billion is is habitable. Well, that's still a lot of uh, planet pleasure. So we've got all of these, uh, hopefully, a lot of planets in the habitable zone. And then I guess the next part of my thinking on this as a fiction writer is how far are we away from modifying ourselves biologically or with mechanics to expand the range of that habitable zone? Habitable zone? How far away are we from, let's say, okay, instead of this temperature range that we can maintain, now we can live happily in this temperature range, up to freezing and boiling, for example, where we, we just expand our, the number of places that we can go comfortably because we've modified our own selves. And then we could also expect that if we can come up with that technology that other races capable of spacefaring and faster than light travel, should we ever find it, would be able to do the same thing. So I, I, I'll, I'll just kick this out to A and to Seth. What happens when we start tinkering ourselves so that we're far more durable and can live in a lot of different environments uh, without the assistance of a suit? Well, and I'll say this. I'll say that 
for me, since I'm neither the scientist nor the fiction writer, I'm, I'm simply the reader in this case, I find it, uh, I mean, I'll be honest, I find Star Trek fantastic and wonderful because I get it and it feels like home to me, right? I'm not worried that the, the green, the otherwise human looking green girl is going to do something awful and ruin my show. So I think that there's some of that actually that goes on and when you're thinking of these concepts too, which is why sci-fi is sometimes so mind bending to me because I, ha I end up having this idea that like, okay, I get this and they may not be in my atmosphere or whatever else. And I know the word spaghettification, but then in a really good sci-fi horrible story, something totally normal goes totally wrong. Like, there's no way we're going to get to another habitable zone because we're not going to live that long or anything else. And then, you know, the, the population mutates or grows through evolution or whatever else. And that's, for me as a reader, what I find so uh, off, sort of fun about scary thriller kind of sci-fi. And, and to just as a heads up, tonight at 9 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Sorry, 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'm going to be recording tomorrow's Space Stories for 365 Days of Astronomy, and I'm going to be reading Scott Sigler's story from our free Wi-Fi on Mars anthology. So if you want a scary story based on something going terribly wrong during a space journey, um, we'll give you your bedtime story and keep you awake with us all night long. That's the, the basis of all my fiction. Nothing goes right until something goes terribly wrong. It has to, you got to come off the rails at some point. The other, the, the, since we're talking about sci-fi tropes, one of my favorite, and by favorite, I mean I hate it with every fiber of my being tropes, <laughs> is part and parcel of the limitations we've had in technology up until the last five or ten years in entertainment, which is aliens are just people with bumpy crap on their face. That's really all it's been for, for since the invention of the, uh, of the movies, is yeah. to present an alien... They are all bipedal, bipedal, bilaterally symmetric, and, you know, two eyes, two nose, two ears, a mouth. They one also, nose. One nose. One, one nose. <laughs> one nose. <laughs> but and, two nostrils. Two yes. Nostrils. There you go. And that's, that's something that I, I will not, I just do not do in my own fiction. Everything is try to make it as different looking as possible and try and imagine the evolution from single cell up through the first organisms that come out of the water and onto land, et cetera. But now that we have all this technology to make actual aliens, we haven't seen any aliens, really any good aliens in the movies. Everything oh, no. from District Nine, you had Disney some very non-human. Pretty well, close. I, I, they were nah, they, no, 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 they, they were just they were ingredients for a plate of fruit de la mer or something like that. They were for a seafood <laughs> platter. Those guys, they were just crayfish. You know, blown up crayfish. But but I have to tell you, Scott, I actually you know consult for. Uh, Hollywood occasionally, and they, they fly me down to L.A. and have me talk to the directors and writers. You have to understand, and I'm sure you understand as a writer, that the fact that they all do look somewhat like us, almost always, and, and you're quite right about that, even now when it isn't necessary anymore. In the 1950s, 1960s, it was a guy in a rubber suit, so of course he's going to look like you. When it was Star Trek in the early versions, there was no budget, so of course he's going to look like you. Sure, but nowadays, back then. <laughs> nowadays <laughs> no. it doesn't have to look like you. Except that, except that, it's an enormous. Oh, uh oh, oh, we lost, we lost. Oh so. no, we froze. We there, there we go. Frozen. Okay, okay. unfroze. <laughs> oh, unfroze. Well, you're back, so you're back. <laughs> oh, so we well, heard right. it was an enormous something, and it cut out right when yes. it was an enormous. Well, that that was exactly the the combination of the Citibank vault in New York, actually. <laughs> but you missed that. No, what I was saying. You... Oh no! Oh. Well, I'll, I'll I'll jump in in case we don't get his feedback. It really, and this is um, the equation that I never thought of, and I just heard uh, somebody do an interview with James Cameron and explain this because when I heard about um, Avatar, I was incredibly excited because I thought my lifelong dream to see an actual alien race brought to the screen and interacting with humans was going to come true and we were going to get to experience something that we've n that no one's ever really experienced in the movies before something truly alien interacting with people and it just looks real and then they turn out to be 10 foot tall smurfs and that was 
super, uh, super. Uh, wait, 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 wait. They were smushed with tails. Light up tails. Hair yes, things. yes. Really hair things. Yeah, no. Smushed with no. tails. And, and what uh, Cameron said was, and maybe Seth back, he can talk to us if he talks to the Hollywood types much more than I do, is Cameron needs the audience to identify with the main mm-hmm. characters, which happen to be this alien race. Yep. So that brings us back to facial expression. Uh, you know, that's the big one. And body language and things you can do as a storyteller to communicate emotion and intent. Um, I think they left it on the table. They could have tried to do that with a whole different uh, whole different physiology and really, really blown it out of the water. Granted, it was, you know, made more money than any movie ever. So I think they got something right. But, uh, I mean, it, it, to tell a proper story visually and with audio it helps if they look like us so we understand where they are coming from. Seth, is that something that you run into in, in those meetings? Yeah, well, I mean, they do ask me what they would look like. More, more frequently, they ask why are they here or what weaponry do they have? I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's a, really? always, a, always a good question. Yeah, I, I always have fun with those questions because they are kind of, kind of bonkers. But in, in terms of what they look like, look, I, I think Scott has already hit on it. Uh, what you didn't hear when my audio cut out was when I gave the combination to the uh, vault of Citibank in, in lower Manhattan there. So you didn't hear that. But, but what I was trying to say is that indeed it's a, it's just a shortcut to the storytelling. If they look something like you, you already know how to read their, their emotions, their body language, their faces. Just as Scott said, if, if the aliens look like my, you know, my, my 10 speed bicycle in the garage, you wouldn't know whether he was hungry, whether he wanted to mate with you, whether he wanted to take over the earth, and you'd have to deal with all that. Uh, and that's just a waste of uh, expository storytelling. Here's another trope uh, from Tommy Lung. Uh, Assuming we even have a slight chance of fighting off a star-spanning species that wants to invade this planet, and I would add that a star-spanning species would even want to invade this planet in the first place. Like, what's the deal with that? Yeah, that, that's a question you get. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. No, I just, this popped up, uh, I think it was an io9 conversation, Charlie Jane Anders and, and Phil, the bad astronomer, astronomer, were tweeting about this. And there's, yeah, it, it, uh, let, me hear what, let me hear what Seth has to say first. Why would they come here? What do they want out of this place? Yeah, uh, there's nothing that we have, actually. Nothing that we have that they don't have, other than our culture, of course. They may have come for the bad movies. They may have come for the rock and roll. They may have come for, you know, for, for the statuary in Central Park, they, they could come for that. But there's, there's nothing else we have. I mean, in terms of resources and so forth. I mean, you mentioned Avatar. Right, we went there because of the unobtainium. Remember? Yeah, that was kind of ridiculous. <laughs> well, it, it was because it, actually Cameron made an error there because he told you how much it was worth per kilogram. Somewhere in the movie, there's a line: thirty million dollars a kilogram, whatever it was. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. the number. But at the time, I did a quick calculation because they also told you how long it took for the rockets to get from Pan. Oh, so. Minimum cost for ship one kilogram of unobtainium back to Earth. If you did the calculation, the yeah. same as buying for the shipping. You probably wouldn't do it. Yeah, <laughs> but I have I have a theory on that. I think, and I don't know. I don't have a categorical knowledge of sci-fi, so somebody's probably done this. But it seems to me that a a superior race would come here specifically for us because we are really smart monkeys and we reproduce on our own. So they could grab many of us for educated or intelligent slave labor. They could get us to do the dangerous things they don't want to do. They could get us to do the farming, the colonization, the shipbuilding. You know, it could be like the space equivalent of a Russian submarine. You want it to go faster? Just take the shielding off the reactor. They're only sailors. Who really cares about that? You know, you get Human beings that can be taught to do just about anything, if the race is sufficiently superior enough to control us, well, then they can grab populations, take them to other places, and have that population breed and have an endless, support, endless supply of really smart labor. Um, so that's one. And then, Nicole, back to yours, that there's always, there's always this thought that alien race comes to Earth, tries to blow us up, we fight back and win. Yay, everybody loves Will Smith movies, but boo, that would never happen. They'd wipe us out. 
And yet, in our own history, a lot of the time when an advanced superior culture goes from one place to another, with a lot of technology, they don't succeed in exterminating the local population. So in our own history on this planet, we don't often see uh, cultures completely wiped out. They somehow manage to stick around or integrate or find a way to fight back. And even centuries later, they can reemerge and say, look, this is our culture and we're taking this area back. So Earth is a big place. Even if it's an alien culture, unless they can bust out those actual death rays, I think uh, with, with several billion people, there's a good chance that people will be around to fight, up, fight, fight back for quite some time. And, and I have to admit, my favorite use of humanity by advanced aliens is from Merle Lafferty's, uh, I guess it's a novella, um, Marco and the Red Granny. Um, it's, it's this fabulous short story, and I've heard more books are coming, and I can't wait. Um, and the premise is an advanced, uh, society, an advanced alien race comes to Earth, and they have senses that we have. And so they end up bringing artisans from Earth to a colony that by treaty they have on the moon and creating new art forms with them where they're able to embed literature into apparel. Uh, they're able to embed scent into jewelry, which admittedly Sir Amy has since then figured out how to do. Um, but but one of the, the really fascinating things is they're totally into the reality TV genre. And so they end up bringing back the gladiator games. And humans are more than willing to be gladiators to the death on reality TV for aliens. Oh, <laughs> and uh, so if you haven't read Marco and the Red Granny, I, I love it. It's, it's one of my favorite easy reads. And there's some real meat in it if you choose to read it at that level, which is why I can't wait for the rest of the, the books to come out. And going back to what Seth said, they might come here for the rock and roll. Uh, that's a book by Rob Reed called Year Zero, yeah. where the aliens, our signals are broadcast all over the galaxy. And it turns out we suck at everything there is to suck at except making music, which we're really good at. So they come and listen to our music. Then they realize they've illegally downloaded uh, trillions of copies of our music and we bankrupt the galaxy. So it's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> wow. No undertones there. No other messaging. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, I wanted to bring up something for Seth. I know you've done a little bit of uh, sci-fi sort of entertainment as well. Something about a turkey in St. Louis? Oh, well, yeah, well, that's quite... Heard this one. Well, yes. It's on YouTube, I think, actually. It is uh, on but, YouTube. <laughs> well, we, well, we used to make 16 millimeter movies when I was uh, much younger. And uh, we, we made a film called The Teenage... This was in the... Well, never mind what it was, but put it this way. It was just before the Mexican-American... Just before the Mexican-American War. Oh. But... And, and we made this film called The Turk... No, it was called The Teenage Monster Blob from Outer Space, which I was... And we showed it, and it was, it was awful. And uh, the guy I made it with, uh, Bob O'Connell, a guy I knew at grad school, he said, you know, Shostak gets a turkey. And I said, well, Bob, if we're going to make turkeys, why don't we make a real turkey? And instead of making the whole movie, why don't we just make the trailer? Because then we could just put in the good parts and leave everything else out. And we did. We made the turkey that ate St. Louis. It runs for like two and a half minutes. It was just a trailer. And uh, we entered it in the Baltimore International Film Festival, I have to say. And it was up against, you know, commercial... Uh, uh, theater films, I mean, real movies, it was up against heavy-duty competition. And despite that, I mean, it lost. It lost. <laughs> but it's on YouTube, and actually, uh, Bob O'Connell's professor where I went to grad school, and so that's how I heard about it. Oh, um, they were still showing it to the grad students a while later. So, yeah, check that out. That is uh, Seth Shostak's foray into science fiction as well. <laughs> well, we made a lot of them, I can tell you. Yes. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to remind you guys that uh, Dark Overlord Media has pledged uh, to match your donations while they're still on the show. Uh, so they'll still be with us for a little bit more, up to a, up to a thousand dollars. Is that right? Yep, up to a thousand dollars. So I've seen about seven hundred come in. I think uh, we're we're trying to track that. Uh, we've also just gotten a big donation from Astronomy FM. So thank you guys so much. You are. Uh, they're rebroadcasting the show uh, in real time, and uh, so you guys have given us a big donation as well. So thank you. Not to mention we have Michael in the green room now. <laughs> yeah, and um, back up. And Nicole, at the beginning of this hour, uh, Ryan Consell asked uh, he could do something with his art, with his armor, and I'm going to buy that. 
Did you uh, see the tweet? Donate. I saw the tweet up in my glass. <laughs> I did, yeah. So I'm going to buy that from him, and and we're and he's just going to let me know how much I need to donate to you guys for that. So that thank worked you, out too. Ryan. That is. I so know. Thank you, Ryan. I'm excited about that. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so we actually have, speaking of donations, um, one other thing that we'd like to talk about while we have a chance, since we're all here together, which is um, later this summer, CosmoQuest and Dark Overlord Media have a Kickstarter. That is not my phone. Um, uh, that we're going to launch a Kickstarter to map the Stiglerverse to mm-hmm. the known exoplanets. Is that right? Yes. Yes. That, I, yep. Yeah. Yep. I am so excited about this because I am, of course, a big fan of the Siglerverse and uh, have been reading, oh gosh, all the series, all the books, but uh, Tim and I have been reading the GFL series as well. And I'm still having nightmares We've about... we got her, <laughs> her <laughs> reading your, your horror. Yeah. But the, uh, the GFL is young adult, and so it's not nearly as, as nightmare-inducing. Yeah. Um, but I'm so excited to map out... Actually, my boyfriend's also making a quilt out of the GFL shirt. So, hey, <laughs> you're sending us all these T-shirts. He's making a quilt out of all the teams in the Galactic Football League. We're, we're, really, we're incredibly excited about this. I mean, first of all, because it's going to... You know, all the, the, the proceeds are going to benefit CosmoQuest, so that's a chance for us to help out with that. But... Yeah. I don't know if people have done this before. If they have, anybody out there in the chat re- realm, email me, Scott at ScottSigler.net. I'm curious. We're going to take all of our fictional planets in the Siglerverse, and there's about 50 right now. So it's not the kind of story where there's unlimited planets with unlimited life and it's uncalculable. No, we got about 50 known planets right now, all with their own cultures, and, and a lot of them are part of broader governments, so three, four, five planet governmental systems. And we're going to try and map that to actual known exoplanets, at least a, a bunch of them. The end goal of it is, so as people get into the series, particularly young people get into the series in the years and decades to come, we're going to provide links and websites in the books, uh, talk about the audio books, put them in the e-books, print books, etc. So people, do you want to see where these planets actually are in, in a galactic map? And then they will go out and hopefully look at that and get some exposure to the uh, to all the amazing astronomy that we have at our disposal, and hopefully you know kindle some imagination, cultivate some love for science, really get people to go. Wait a minute, I can actually look at where these are on a map because and being a D and D guy from back in the day or yeah. Lord of the Rings, etc. I, mean, I don't know how many times in Game of Thrones I flipped yes. to that. That a centerfold map and go, oh, Walter Frey's getting his stuff all in a bunch right over here. <laughs> People are going to be able to do that with an actual star map and then realize that that is an actual star that they can go out and get more information on. So we're going to combine the worlds of fiction and sci-fi, and I think it's going to be awesome. And then we're going to have various levels of donations for that to get real cool stuff. Uh, hey, what kind of stuff are we talking about having for that? Uh, actually, this is a question more for Nicole. Uh, so far, we have fleshed it out enough to, Nicole has done most of the work, but um, we have fleshed it out enough to sort of price the actual amount of money that it costs to produce, and, and Dark Overlord will take on that cost itself so that all the money is donated is going to end up going to CosmoQuest. And the levels, uh, Nicole, help me out. There's like a there's a Google Hangout, isn't there, with about, Scott yeah. and you guys? And Get, getting, a, getting, a, getting us to come give a talk through Google Hangout, um, different levels of signed posters and, and things from Scott, from me, from Pamela. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, I don't remember. It's, we, we, <laughs> it's in a Google Doc. <laughs> um, we talked about it at a much higher level, having us, you know, uh, come come out and meet us, have lunch with us, have dinner with us. Uh, yeah, you go to a show con. Up That's a, a really con. fun one. Yeah, so if yeah. you come to a con or, or yeah, if you, and we're all there together. You can sit down and have a sort of buy a level where you have dinner with the whatever group of four or five or something. Right, right. So there'll be different levels of funding of, uh, you know, every, anything from, from just getting just getting the material itself, getting it autographed, hanging out with us, um, hanging out with us in real life. Um, and uh, gosh, I can't remember what else we had on that list, but a bunch of cool stuff. And like you said, all that money is going to go towards supporting CosmoQuest and supporting the science, the science behind the sci-fi that we're going to be putting out there. Yeah, yeah, it's really fun. And then, and then once it's over, we'll have a certain number of. Um, obviously, the big thing you get from the Kickstarter, I think, is the actual poster of that. And then we have a certain amount left over to sell once it's done. Um, that would also benefit CosmoQuest. Yeah. Um, and someone's asking. So for right now, where do you donate? The link is on our screen here. So while I'm talking, that should show up. 
cosmoquest.org slash donate. That's where we have uh, the uh, PayPal link where you can donate and the ticker showing us how, how far we've gotten. So that's for right now. But then, yeah, look forward to that Kickstarter that's coming up this summer um, where we merge with the Sigler, the real verse with the Sigler verse. I'm excited about that. And, and this is one of those projects that you can, first of all, we're going to be stupidly happy doing it, but you can really see how kids will be able to, like jump to science from this. I embarrassingly can embarrassingly can admit um, when I was a little little kid, I was totally into the original Battlestar Galactica. Had a total crush on Richard Hatch, um, and then I I got into Greek mythology because of Apollo and and uh, Cassiopeia and all of these names from the constellations. Well, I got to the constellations via the Greek gods, and once I got to the constellations, I kept going. And so I worked on writing fanfic when I was in late elementary school and middle school because I was that type of a little kid, and I designed my universe trying to map it out on star maps, and that's what I did as a geeky little kid. Well, Scott's going to help feed more geeky little kids like I was so that they can make their own jump from the pages of fiction to the pages of fact. And I just love getting to help open that door and give those kids a leg up on their own explorations of our galaxy. Cool. Uh, we've been asked to put the link, the donate link on YouTube. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Oh, we bummer. Allow uh, direct links and comments, and I can't actually edit the uh, show description. But I've kind of put it in cosmoquest.org/donate. Um, in the comments, so you can kind of check let it me, out there. Let me, uh, as long as we got Seth on, let me ask Seth a quick question. Uh, you've been doing this for a while. Are you? Do you feel that we are getting stronger in the worlds of entertainment and sci-fi as far as presenting as much fact as we can while still telling a good story because it's about the story? Or do you feel we, we hit the apex somewhere in the past few years or decades and now we're back on a downslope? Uh, you know, the, the, a movie like Prometheus comes out with a lot of cool stuff, and then a lot of stuff you're like, wait a minute, you could have used real science and it wouldn't have changed the story at all. What are your thoughts on that? Are we, are we still moving up or are we coming down? Well, I, I really can't see a trajectory one way or the other there, Scott. I don't know whether we're going up or down. But uh, I'll, I'll be radical here. I mean, <laughs> as, I say, as I say, I, I've consulted on a number of these films, and, uh, and to be honest, although that's a great thing to do, uh, and it's great if they get the science right as opposed to not getting it right. In the end, and you just said it, what counts is the storyline. And you could make the argument, I've even made the argument occasionally, that maybe it doesn't matter very much. A lot of people go into science because they've seen a nifty sci-fi film or read a nifty sci-fi novel. And, you know, what, what grabbed them? Was it the fact that the science is right? Did they go see a Star Trek movie and, and, and the Starship Enterprise flies by the camera and they hear a whoosh? And do they walk out of the theater and they say, well, that's it. A whoosh in space? I'm not going to watch this anymore, right? Nobody walks out. They don't care. They don't care. Mind you, in medical films, it really matters whether you get it right. But, but I think in space opera, it probably doesn't matter that much. What, well, grabs, what grabs you is the emotional appeal of the storyline. And if you get them there, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice a lot of science. The only thing I would say that, would, uh, that is somewhat of a disappointment, and that is that what the screenwriters usually want from you is for you to solve a plot problem for them. They've got a technical problem in the plot. And they say, look, uh, these guys, uh, rocket ship goes behind this planet, and they have to lose contact somehow. And how can I do that? They want you to solve <laughs> this very specific problem. Whereas if you suggest to them, you know, there's all sorts of new discovery in astronomy and also in physics that you're not you're using. You're using the same astronomy as you could have used a half century ago. Uh, they're less interested in that, and that's somewhat of a disappointment. And the only, the only parallel thought to that, I guess, is if, if movies are using more spiritualism to explain the great unknown. You think back to Star Trek, the original Star Trek, and there's not a whole lot of science going on in that. There's all kinds of, let's rearrange the phaser array, and we're done three minutes before close. How many scientific careers have been launched because little kids sat in front of that TV and were mesmerized by that every week? Yeah. And, and more of the hand-waving science, I think, uh, attributes to or, or is in line with what you're saying. 
Sometimes I wonder, though, when sci-fi delves into the world of, well, God did it. Does that is that a newer development? Like the end of the, the new Battlestar Galactica, which was fabulous for so many years. Spoiler alert. Then it's it gets to the end. I won't spoil. <laughs> you get to the end of it, and you're like, whoa, that was not what I was expecting at all. I shall say yeah. that. So I was not pleased with the last half hour <laughs> of that series. If they had <laughs> rearranged the phaser array, I'd have been down with that. But the way it ended, you're like, okay, this is, is this still, that's the question. Is this still science fiction if yeah. we're diving over if the tropes switch over into an un, omnipotent being and all powerful spiritual answer is that is that still a science fiction trope or is that something new yeah do I care I mean really you know maybe it doesn't matter if I like this story because the spiritual aspect of it I agree with you it's, it's hard to justify that in science uh, you won't find in physics review letters too many too many uh, papers in which they said and then God did it Right, yeah, you can't get that past the uh, referees, or but or any of them. <laughs> yeah, yes, right. but I mean, you know, it is it is part of the uh, the storytelling tradition. I mean, people like that this spiritual aspect, and and you know, the original Star Trek. Uh, I I actually wrote a letter back in those days to uh, Gene Roddenberry, and I said, you know, if you pay my bus fare over to Burbank once every two weeks, I'll come over and redline the script so you get the science right. And and I have to tell you that bus fare was a dollar fifty from where I was living, and so it wasn't wasn't really a lot of money. But he wrote back and he said, no, we've already got the Rand Corporation doing that. They're a think tank over in Santa Monica, California. Uh, so he already figured that all the science he needed was in there, and and maybe he was right. Maybe he was right. It wasn't about the science. It was yeah. about it was about our future. As long as it doesn't take you, and this is something that. I've probably heard Scott say as long as it doesn't actually take you out of the story it's not so bad that it takes you away from the plot and it takes you away from your emotional investment then it's okay you can kind of gloss over it so it doesn't have to be perfect um, for me uh, if you want to talk about sci-fi movies it was it was contact that uh, really spurred me someone was pointing out it was the 16th anniversary of the movie coming out oh, recently. So, I was uh, in graduate school when that came out. That was yeah. what made me actually decide, oh, that's cool. I want to do astronomy. And You're so cute. <laughs> and I ended up being a radio yeah. astronomer, too. So, hey, it's all good. Well, and, and for me, it was reading the book. Mm -hmm. So it's... It I didn't do go... that until I worked at the VLA. <laughs> then I huh. had to read the book. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, obviously, we were, we were consultants for the film, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that was a lot of fun. But on the other hand, contact is somewhat... Sui generis. I mean, that's you know, that's a little different than most sci-fi films because oh, yeah. it was written by a practicing scientist yeah. and and one who knew quite a bit about the uh, about SETI. Although I have to say, <laughs> you know, they would call me up every day, you know, Warner Brothers, and they would they would ask me questions like, "So, Seth, what does it look like when you fly through a wormhole?" You know, as if I did that. I did that. I said, "Well, I do it. Yeah, I do it every summer, and I'll tell you what it's like." Well, con you mean from the driver's seat, or you mean from the outside? <laughs> as far as the movie goes, Contact is one that blends in perfectly with what we were just talking about, which is it's it's an enormous enormous amount of actual hard science. And watching that as a layman was fascinating. All the different stuff they did, and embedding this signal and that signal, and watching them reconstruct everything. Then you get to the end. And it falls into that other sci-fi trope of, you know, any technology sufficiently advanced to us it might as well be magic. And really, you get to the end of it, it's not just magic, it's spiritualism, too. She's finding, Jodie Foster's finding her purpose in life and talking to her dead father. And it might as well be God who just showed up who can do all of these amazing things. So maybe that is yet another science fiction trope. The uh, all-powerful being comes in somewhere after we can take our space jalopy to a planet, get off, and walk around. And it's a long walk, Seth, not a short walk. <laughs> well, I, I got to ask you, Scott, what was the function of Matthew McConaughey in that film then? Mm, uh, right. I can answer mm. that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, the, the women all know. The women all know. They all say it doesn't matter what his function is. But, but you know, after all, he was saying, I can't live without God. Right? There you go. Yep. Yeah. You got something? Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> moving the mic. Just oh, okay. Moving the mic. Okay. Um, we did hit the 1K mark during this uh, hour with you guys. So we will. Dark Overlord Media will be matching the funds. That is um, so awesome. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Everyone you guys out there donating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. A real girl and our future Dark Overlord. Thank you. I just love well, saying that. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Uh, so, 
we have a quick question from Ciro Villa. A question for Scott. How many hours per day on average do you spend writing? Especially huh. lately, especially with pandemic. <laughs> uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask A that question. She knows what I'm doing more than I am. Uh, what we do, I will tell you this. What we do is we try to have him write uh, three to four hours a day every weekday mm -hmm. and three hours on Saturday at minimum. That's what we try. But, you know, just like everybody else, things come up. You have to shuffle your schedule around. So there are some days where he writes, if it's possible, if he's on a tear and things are going well, we'll reschedule things and he'll write eight hours a day, something like that. But most of the time, it's three to four hours a day, six days a week. Nice. That was a huge inspiration seeing your, your page counts for pandemic while I was trying to finish my uh, dissertation. So, yeah. <laughs> rock. <laughs> so cool. Uh, any last questions? Or, or last comments? Yeah. Uh, I will do some last minute pimping since we hit our, uh, our financial target. You can learn about all my stuff at scottsigler.com, which is S C O T T S I G L A R.com. We give away a free podcast episode there every week, which is part of an unabridged audiobook. We give away everything we've done audiobook wise for free so far. Or just go to the Amazon store and search for Scott Sigler, or go to iTunes and search for Scott Sigler, and we've got about 10 full-length free audiobooks up there, as well as stuff you can buy if you are so inclined. And if you are interested in getting up to speed so that you are ready for the Kickstarter, the CosmoQuest uh, Sigler-verse Kickstarter, then you should be reading, mostly reading the Galactic Football League series. But all of Scott's stuff is worth reading, all part of the Sigler-verse. Uh, and, and if you um, want nightmares about triangles, <laughs> That's actually my favorite of your series, man. That's why I'm just dying for the third book to come out. So the Infected trilogy is it's all it's biological horror, but yeah. it's so I shouldn't read it. I should no, not have read so. it. I regret reading it. Which I think is probably the best compliment I can give a horror writer. That's my new cover blurb. I regret reading this. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dr. Pamela gets it. was fabulous. The problem was the science was too true, and now I like have paranoia about genetic engineering. <laughs> we sharp ear with blue triangles next time. I was talking. thinking about um, when Seth was saying like he's got all these writers come to him and say fix my plot problem. Yeah. Scott actually has exactly the reverse problem. He'll send out to his his PhD biologists and chemists and MDs and all that other stuff, he'll send out, this is the plot I want. And they will be like, yeah, no, man, no, no, that's not the science. We you love you because you listen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Seth, any last comments from the SETI Institute on uh, maybe you have a favorite sci-fi trope or least favorite? Well, I, I go to just about every sci-fi movie I can. I'm a great fan of that. I'm, uh, so, you know, and, and in fact, if they're cheesy, I kind of like them better somehow. So there's that. Yeah, and the SETI Institute, I recommend anybody interested in the SETI Institute, since Scott did some pimping there, I'll do yes. a little bit. But, uh, you know, check out the SETI Institute's website, that's SETI.org. And, of course, uh, our radio show, Big Picture Science, bigpicturescience.org. Uh, every week we talk to about five different scientists. So there you go. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, guys. This was a really fun discussion topic. Uh, <laughs> thanks to yeah, you. Thank you. Heart, heart, heart. A. While we have A on, I want to say A before the day is out. Happy Ooh. birthday! Yeah, to happy, Elise oh, Anders. To Elise. Hey, it's true. Yeah. Elise Anders has a birthday today. That's true. So I tweeted it earlier today, but I've been busy doing this. But I wanted to say happy birthday to Elise. Uh, we love you, Mofo. So. <laughs> Well, thank you All guys right. so much. This was super fun, and thanks to everybody who donated. Uh, I love that there are a handful of people who donated just to stick it to Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm like, that works for me too. Whatever, science education, we all win. <laughs> and, and if you want to hear me read one of Scott's stories to compare his story with my, verse, my voice versus his voice, because that's really why I want to do this, um, we are going to be doing that in the 9 p.m. block, which is... Uh, 52 minutes from now. All right. And you do. In case you're wondering, you absolutely want to hear Pamela read that crazy story. Yeah, I heard it at Dragon Con last year, and it was pretty awesome. So, win. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank we you guys so are... much.
thank you. We are going to transition to our next segment. Is that what we we're doing? we are? So, um, Richard, if uh, we're going to invite you in. Um, we were originally going to have Courtney Hogan here right now uh, talking about the new program she is starting, uh, which is Craft for Science, um, except her brother decided to get married today. Um, Darn family. <laughs> and so even if you have the CosmoQuest Hangout-a-thon on your calendar, your brother's wedding takes priority. Uh, so she's out doing that. She should be joining the reception tonight. Um, but for now, uh, we are, uh, do we have Richard yet? Uh, I just sent an invite to Richard. Richard Drum, if you're watching, we'd like you to come on in because we have a video clip, or you have a video clip for us. Yes, so we're going to, Courtney put together a quick commercial for Astro Gear, which is our store that lets you show your love. Um, ah. Okay, I can't reach the okay, stuff right so now. Okay, so you guys can close out with the little phone up at the top right. Sorry, <laughs> I just saw you guys <laughs> chatting at me. Little Thanks. phone hang up -y button at the top right. The little, little phone. Thanks, yeah. Yep. Thanks, <laughs> Which yeah. I realized, thanks. You know, kids of a certain age are not going to recognize really yeah. soon, um, which is kind of strange. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah.